One day in Manhattan, clear as could be, till the planes hit the buildings and changed history. They stood for an hour once the damage was done, but then suddenly crumbled. Ten seconds they were gone. There were cascading projections of steel into dust. It looked like explosions, but it was not discussed. Keeping this here beginning because I've changed the name of my show to Free Speech Zone. So wait a minute, let me get out of the way of this so you can see. We're still at episode 27 on season 7. We're going to keep the same numbering for the show as we go. But go ahead and use the, the, the background that we're going to use. M2. There we are, Free Speech Zone. So now this is our show. And today's going to be a pretty interesting show all the way around. But first we have a kind of a unrelated topic to the show. But it was interesting to, to note. It made all of the different Facebooks and tweets and it's on the Internet big time. And many of you heard about it. But, the, I mean, amazing. A policeman refusing to enforce somebody's constitutional rights because he says Obama trashed the Constitution so he doesn't have to enforce it. A cop said that on camera. Okay, so we're going to go right to that right now. Well, maybe in a second. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so we're going to... Let me know when you have that ready. But, okay, th after you see it, we'll come back. It's less than two minutes. I have major objections of what's going on over at the, uh, the shelter there. Um, my First and Fourth Amendment rights were uh, violated. My civil rights were violated. Well, I was have I ever that right? because Obama just decimated the freaking Constitution. So I don't give a damn because if he doesn't follow the Constitution, we don't have to. It's New Jersey case law. Yes, you, you don't have to. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you he doesn't that? have to follow the Constitution. Because if our president can... can you say that one more time? I'm not sure I heard it clearly. Obama just decimated the freaking Constitution. So I don't give a damn because if he doesn't follow the Constitution, we don't have to. It's New Jersey case law. Yeah. Just tell me that one more time so I completely understand what you just said. Obama just decimated the freaking Constitution. So I don't give a damn because if he doesn't follow the Constitution, we don't have to. It's New Jersey. You know, you're aware of your rights and everything like that. So, you are talking about the property? No, this is public property. This is owned by municipality. Okay, and there's something to define trespassing. On public property? You go into the building. That's public property as well. Okay, sir, listen. Why, why am I being... Now, yeah, you're right. I forgot to mention this. This, well, the cop thing is an outrage, and the cop did uh, offer his resignation after the controversy, and they decided to accept it. Okay, well, we kind of expected something like that. But on the, I, on the subject of free speech zone... Uh, our, the one of our crew, Steve Doss, happened to be in Clark County at the Clark County Fairgrounds right across the Columbia River from where we are here. It was in Washington, the, the lowest county in Washington, I mean right by the river. And on the fairgrounds, they had this free speech zone sign. Now go ahead and take it out. Yeah, all free speech. All free speech activities protected by the First Amendment must comply with the written policies and procedures of the Event Center. A copy of the written policies can be obtained from the Event Center Administration Administrative Office. Okay, put go ahead and bring me back. Now that's a real government sign. It's not a parody. It's not a joke. My show's name was a parody based on the 2004 Republican. National Convention, where they took all of the protesters, rounded them up, and took them to a condemned manufacturing warehouse that was closed because it had toxic contamination. It had chain link fences installed around the perimeter with concertina wire on it, and that was labeled a free speech zone. 
That's so outrageous. That's why the name of my show is Free Speech Zone. But this behind me is a real sign. Ugh. Okay, well, I've got something else that's frustrating. We're going to be talking about Israel and Gaza, this whole show. And let's start with the new Israeli flag. Maybe you've seen this before. Take a look at that. Okay. Take a good look at that. Okay. You understand what's happening? Now, people are going to argue that the, the Nazis put Jews in ovens and Israelis aren't doing that. You cannot compare them to Nazis. Yes, you can, because they're just as fascist and full of hate against another race as the Nazis were. And they're planning to completely annihilate the Palestinians. Now, you think that's hyperbola? Do you really? Well, we've got a, a clip coming up that's going to be an interesting one. It, it's George Galloway, and he's going to tell this phone guy who calls into his radio show in Great Britain exactly, you know, why is Israel justified? He asks the question, who gave Great Britain the right to give away somebody else's property to a third party? Let's just go into this video and we'll start, start out our show with that. Subject of the Palestinians. Here's Alex in North London. Alex, go ahead, sir. Hi, George. I'm calling from North London. I've yes. Been, I've been listening to you for three months now. Okay. Never had the chance to listen to speak to you. Okay. But um, I was just calling on. I was listening to you a couple of nights ago, and you were talking um, to these um, to these people, and they were saying that Israel, the Jews, did not have the right to gain Israel from the Palestinians. And I was just saying, throughout history, the Jews have been persecuted, obviously, from the Holocaust. And we were granted Israel as a result of this. And I feel that... Um, granted by whom? We were granted, well, we were granted from, from Britain and other countries, granted us that. But what, gave, what right did Britain have to grant you somebody else's country? Well, it's due because we lost six million people. No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not arguing about that. I'm going to come on to that. But what right did Britain have to grant you somebody else's country? We had the right because we lost six million people and we did not have a home. Well, yeah, I'm going to ask you for a third time. What right did Britain have to grant you somebody else's country? Well, they didn't. Well, they were giving us the right because it was we were. Um, they were basically gave us because of the. The, um, but they gave you somebody else's country. That's the point I'm making, Alex. Can you deal with it? Yeah, but the Jews have had to, um, have also had to, um, they've dealt with it throughout history. Well, Alex, I don't know if you came on with a script and you can't deviate from it. Can you please answer that point? And we'll come to the Holocaust and who was responsible for it and who should have paid and what they should have paid for it. But given that you've said Britain granted you and your presumably saying you because you're Jewish, somebody else's country. I'm asking you, what right did Britain have to grant you somebody else's country? Well, Britain, well, Britain, they, you could say they didn't have a right, but they came in and dealt with us and um, with the Jews having lost all these lives, and they basically granted us this land. Okay. Well, uh, uh, I see I'm getting nowhere on this, Alex, so let me deal with your overarching uh, point. Maybe you're just not equipped to deal with the... Uh, principal point that I have made. The Jews have suffered racist anti-Semitism down the ages in many, many European countries, including our own. Uh, they were subject to regular uh, discrimination at best and pogrom and murder at most. That's undoubtedly true. The one place in the entire world that Jews were neither discriminated against nor subject to pogrom, was the Muslim world. In fact, so much was that the case that when Christianity came back to power in Spain, in Andalusia, in the um, western extent of the Islamic empire, when the Muslims left, the Jews left with them because they feared the Christian anti-Semitism which would be unleashed uh, in the wake of the departure 
of the Islamic civilization in the West. That's why uh, so many Jews are to be found even today and were to be found in profusion before the creation of the State of Israel in countries like Morocco and along the North African coast because under the protection of the Muslims, the Jews left Europe and went to live in North Africa. The Palestine that was wiped off the map when Britain granted you somebody else's country had Jews living side by side with Christians and Muslims for century upon century without the slightest trace of discrimination or violence or pogrom. So, what's happened is that Christian anti-Semitism in Europe, which massacred six million Jews in the greatest crime in human history, was paid for not by the Christian countries of Europe that either practiced or turned a blind eye to that anti-Semitism, but was paid by the very people who were completely innocent of that Holocaust, who had never persecuted the Jews, who had never pogromed the Jews. And that seems to me to add insult to the injury suffered by a people whose country was wiped off the map, who were uh, dispersed into exile to make way for a Zionist idea which was granted to European Jews, because these were the first settlers, granted to European Jews by Britain. And as you have singularly failed, four times I asked you, to acknowledge that Britain had no right to give away somebody else's country, one country given to a second people, the land that actually belonged to a third people, it seems to me an all-round injustice, don't you think, Alex? Yeah. I agree that they didn't have, they didn't so much have the right, but they were stepping in after the Holocaust to grant it to the Jews. But it was, it was a must. It was long before the Holocaust that Britain stepped in. Britain stepped in in 1917 with the Balfour Declaration made by the British uh, Minister Balfour on our behalf to a group of atheistic Zionist Jews. I make the point about atheism because it's now claimed that this is some biblical land right, as if God was an estate agent. The men to whom Israel was promised were atheistic Jews. They were not only not speaking for all Jews, they represented at that time in 1917 a tiny proportion of the world's Jews. Most of the world's Jews supported communist or socialist parties and ideas at that time. The Zionists represented a tiny sliver of Jewish opinion at that time. Yet, Balfour promised them the land which belonged to a third people without consulting either the British or the world's Jews and least of all, consulting the Palestinians. Okay, well, thanks very much for talking. Okay, Alex, thanks, thanks for listening, my friend. Okay, well, there you have it. it it's amazing that... The guy just didn't get it. He kept wanting to justify it. And a lot of, I lived in Israel for a year and a half. I understand that. I was a, a member of what turned out to be, and my dad wouldn't really, he didn't like the idea that I joined. I was 12 years old. They were trying to bring me into the community. And so they had me join what turned out to be the Israeli brown shirts, just like the Nazi brown shirts. It's an organization called Hashomer Hatzair, which means the young watchman. And we'd meet every week and go running around the, the, the territory. We'd divide into groups, and we were the Israeli against the Arabs. And, you know, of course, we'd take turns being the Arabs, the villains. And, and they'd play war games. And they were teaching these kids, you know, how to be when they grew up to go slaughter the Palestinians. And I didn't realize that. The people were generally good. But they're controlled by a propaganda machine that's relentless, just like our neocons. And remember, neocon was just a politically correct term for Nazi. Now, neocon and Nazi were synonymous, and now Zionist is the same thing. Now, I didn't say Jew. This has nothing to do with being Jewish or being Muslim. It's strictly about people trying to steal somebody else's land. And if you don't understand that and you try to justify it on some biblical pretense, you just don't have your humanity. Now I'm going to show you what this biblically 
supported group of Israelis has been doing. War crimes that are insanity. We'll start with 2006. We're going to show you a video here of the Israelis using white phosphorus. So go ahead and play. This is eight years ago. It's from Democracy Now. Sorry about the bad quality. From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now. Give them full credit. Just a few days ago, we documented an attack which took place last Wednesday on the village of Blida, in which the Israelis used um, cluster munitions. While Human Rights Watch is charging Israel with using cluster bombs in Lebanon, the Lebanese president says Israel's using the internationally banned weapon white phosphorus against Lebanese civilians. Dar Jamal reports from the hospitals of Beirut. Well, Human Rights Watch is accusing Israel of using cluster bombs. The Lebanese president, Emile Lahoud, says Israel is also using white phosphorus. Lebanese doctors have reported witnessing the effects of white phosphorus on their patients. Independent journalist Dar Jamal is in Beirut and has spoken to some of those doctors. We reached him earlier today. Yesterday, I went to the Beirut University Hospital. Uh, it's one of the larger hospitals in uh, Beirut, and I was speaking with uh, the assistant director there. His name is Bilal Masri, and uh, he told me, uh, first off, we were talking about the casualty situation, and then this led into uh, the white phosphorus situation in southern Lebanon. And uh, first off, he said that uh, they were receiving very many casualties there, mostly from the south being brought in to them by the Red Crescent and Lebanese Red Cross, and that 55% of all the casualties in Beirut, uh, according to Mr. Masri, were children 15 years or younger. He then uh, said another startling statistic that 30% of all the casualties are, are dying, uh, and this was an extremely high casualty rate, that uh, far higher than anything they saw during the Lebanese Civil War, meaning that if everyone hit, 30% of the people are dying outright. And I asked him why, and he said that it's because the Israelis are using these bombs that can penetrate through bomb shelters, that there's been so many refugees seeking shelter in basements or in bomb shelters and the Israelis are bombing the bomb shelters. War planes are bombing the bomb shelters where refugees are hiding. And also that the, there was such a disproportionate number of children being killed and wounded because children, he said, were the least able to really escape when the, the, the bombings began. Children were the least able to really effectively run, run away and get to safety themselves. While we were talking, he said that it was actually confirmed by the Ministry of the Interior in Lebanon that uh, the minister himself did confirm that the Israelis have dropped white phosphorus in southern Lebanon. And interestingly, just before I had gone to this hospital, I was at a refugee camp in a city park in downtown Beirut, and I interviewed an old man, a 76-year-old baker, uh, who had told me that they fled uh, Napatia uh, down in southern, uh, southern Lebanon, which is the city where it is suspected that this white phosphorus has been used and where it was confirmed by the Ministry of the Interior. And this old man told me that they left because when the bombing there began, this was within the first few days of the of the attack, uh, within the first week, that is, I'm sorry, but that he left because his family was so afraid because nearby where they lived, homes were being bombed, and inside the buildings and outside the buildings, they were uh, glowing, as he described it. He said they were fine. Okay, well, you know, we didn't, the point isn't to show you all kinds of horrors and things, but you understand now, okay, it isn't just an isolated thing. After the community came down on Israel about that, Israel said, oh, we won't do it again. I mean, of course, we're sorry. It's, uh, we didn't realize I, some drug commander it wouldn't have been done by us or what, you know, all the standard crap that you hear from everybody that does something wrong. Well, this one that we're going to show next is from, what, three years later. This is 2009. If they're ready to rock on it. Here we go. Let's go to some of the tactics that Israel is using. Now, we reported on the show earlier that they were using white phosphorus. Uh, now, apparently, CNN has confirmed it for itself. Uh, now, we got it from other sources earlier, from The Guardian and from other uh, sources. Now, CNN says, yes, uh, uh, they have that information as well. Now, they explain both sides of it, uh, and I think it's a terrific report 
and this is a kind of a funny thing to say, but I'm actually proud of CNN for running it. So let's watch it. Is Israel firing white phosphorus into Gaza? Human Rights Watch says yes, and is backed up by munitions experts. And this, say Palestinian doctors, is the result. Dr. Nefis Abu Shaban says he's been treating burns for 27 years, but says he's never seen anything like these. He says most of the severe burn patients have been sent to Egypt. But because of the fighting, this man, Adil, can't get out. He was brought to us last night uh, with severe burns on the back, the face, both lower limbs. It's about 40, 47 percent total burn surface area. Uh, this resulted from uh, some sort of bombs. It might be the uh, bombs which contain phosphorus, as we said before, because his burns are not usual burns, it's severe, it's very deep burns with strange shape. White phosphorus is known to burn flesh down to the bone. It's designed to provide illumination or a smoke screen in battle. Under an international protocol ratified by Israel in 1995, such incendiary weapons are allowed when, quote, not specifically designed to cause burn injury to persons. There's not a, a per se prohibition uh, uh, against uh, using white phosphorus uh, in, in conflict, but there are significant uh, restrictions as to when it's used and how it's uh, to be used. For instance, it is illegal to use white phosphorus against any personnel, not only civilians, but even legal combatants. So it cannot be directed at personnel. So you're limited to having it directed at military targets. International law says incendiary weapons cannot be used where there is a concentration of civilians. And Gaza is one of the most densely populated places on earth. This house north of Gaza City was hit by something Sunday. It's been burning since 1 o'clock in the morning, Munir Hamada tells our cameraman around noon. If you move it with your feet, it reignites. You can't put it out with water. This matches the properties of white phosphorus, which ignites on contact with air. Last week, an Israeli official told CNN, I can tell you with certainty that white phosphorus is absolutely not being used. Now Israeli officials have this response to questions on its use. Any munition that Israel is using is with accordance to the international law. Israel does not specify the types of munition nor types of operations that it's conducting. The precise extent That's to which enough. Israel we'll bring that one back. white phosphorus um, in Gaza. I get tired of hearing, you know, especially when you have to listen to, you know, bad audio and bad video, watch bad video. Those were, you know, old videos on YouTube, probably been uploaded and reposted thousands of times. I don't know. Anyway, but in the interest of showing you, we, we've got another one coming up three years later. In 2012, they did it again. Okay, well, I didn't exactly make it easy for them. They're trying to find the one I asked for. I put dates on these things, but we only have a couple more of these. Here we go. Yeah. Now, now you can see the white phosphorus really blasting down. This one might not have audio. I'm not sure. But there, you see that? That was an anti-personnel device. Okay? Now, there's, there's some phosphorus flares that set fires. But those were, that was an anti-personnel device. Okay? That's, that's designed to mess up people and places and things. The other things were flares just so that per, you can see in the battlefield. That, that might be considered legitimate, except that they keep using it to hurt people. Well, the one you saw that just blasted the phosphorus straight down, that, I mean, that, they got them dead to rights on that one. There they, there they go again. Okay, let's wind that one up. Yeah, and now we jump ahead one year to last year, 2013. Let's see if Israel has learned its lesson yet. You know, are they telling the truth or do, are they going to continue to violate the norms of decency? Uh, do, they're spraying this stuff down on civilians knowingly. 
This is not a mistake. They're not collateral damage. Those are successfully targeted victims that were deliberately targeted. And here we go, 2013 to uh, the Gaza City. We understand that those tanks have been moving in on the sort of southeast and the northwest side of Gaza, Gaza City. Um, also, accusations today that Israel has been using white phosphorus shells, increasing the human suffering inside Gaza. Okay, now, this one looks suspiciously similar to the one we just saw for 2012. And I was checking the dates. These are about six months apart, so it's very possible that this is just a different version of the same one. I'm pretty sure this was the last one that we just showed. So we're going to jump ahead again. Go ahead, take this off. Now, you can do your own search. It's very simple on the net. You know, I, it's so easy that if somebody doesn't know what's going on, it's because they didn't look. It's not because they got the wrong info. It's because they chose not to get the correct info. This is our last one. This is 2014 this year. So you can't you can't put it they try to put it out but it keeps going they didn't show it those are little you know phosphorus burning things <laughs> when i was a welder i welded magnesium and if you didn't keep the oxygen away from it while you're welding it would start its own fire and it would keep going you couldn't put it out now these munitions are designed exactly to to come into people's bodies and keep burning. Once they're in the body, they just keep burning. Burning and burning. Okay, that's a good place to come back, I guess. Okay, now, I'm, that might not have convinced you about the latest thing, but there are lots of other videos out there. But the thing that shocked me the most, I keep hoping, you know, that Israel would be kind of like here in a way, although we did kind of go insane as a country thinking that it was a good idea to kill everybody in the Middle East because we don't want to believe that Dick Cheney and George Bush were part of the group that actually brought down the Trade Center Towers. We know that to be true now. But, you know, I, I did show you the video last time or a time before of the young Israelis on a rooftop where... I don't know if they were on the rooftop, but they were watching the explosions over the border in Gaza and cheering it and saying that we should just wipe them all out. And then the girl kind of realized she was on camera and said, <laughs> well, I'm kind of a fascist. <laughs> yeah, you are. And so is 86% of the country. They just had a poll and they're behind. Oh, my God. I told you that. They want to wipe out the Palestinians. It's not a question of protecting themselves. That's a damn lie. The Israelis, any, any Israeli that believes that they're protecting themselves is a fool. You know, I can't believe there are any people that stupid in Israel. They all know that it's a simple thing, just like they learned from the United States. We went across and did the same thing to the Indians. That's what the Israelis are doing. They have no justification for it. They'll try to justify it every time they do it. And then they'll base the next time on the last time. And they'll keep doing that. Well, now it's come up to the Israeli Knesset. That's the Senate of Israel. And the Speaker of the Senate in Israel, the Deputy Speaker, is advocating wiping out Palestine. Any survivors will get herded into the Sinai Desert where they'll take care of themselves. Of course, Egypt doesn't like that idea. But... The, the Israeli Defense Forces, and that's a Orwellian term, Defense Forces, the Israeli Attack Forces, the IAF, will then level every single building in Gaza Strip, and then they plan to just move in Israeli settlers and rebuild it. The new border of Israel will be all the way out to the ocean. They'll continue the rail, rail line that ended just at the Gaza Strip, but they'll continue that down on and make it safe and secure for... Israelis. 
And if you think that I'm exaggerating, I just happen to have a clip. This is Paul Jay on the Real News Network with some really good analysis and some shocking, shocking, <laughs> I hope it's shocking to you. And I, it, uh, Let's just play it and it'll speak for itself. Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. In Israel's attacks on Gaza, it's now more than 1,900 people are dead, more than 460 of which are children. And the debate within Israel perhaps gets even more chilling on just what the plans might be. Now joining us from Ramallah is journalist Max Blumenthal. He is, is an award-winning journalist, best-selling author. His latest book is Goliath, Life and Loathing in Greater Israel. And as I said, he's in Ramallah, the occupied Palestinian territories, or now some people say the state of Palestine. Thanks for joining us, Max. Good to be with you from this dungeon in Ramallah. Uh, so the debate, uh, when, when you look at the sort of debate in Israeli press, uh, one of the things jumped out at us, uh, this is a piece by uh, uh, Moshe Figlin. Who, uh, he has an article he just wrote, an op-ed, where he said his plan for Gaza. And it, it more or less comes down to uh, a, a let the people of Gaza know uh, that the attack is coming, give one warning, allow people out. In other words, let people run, leave and get, go to Sinai, but I thought that's, uh, the Egyptians would have something to say about that. In, in his piece, he doesn't mention that. Um, and that then flatten the place, more or less, um, and then it, occupy the place completely and essentially ask people to leave, encourage people to leave, give people money to leave, and then occupy Gaza with Jewish settlers and claim Gaza fully as a piece of Israel. Uh, in other words, uh, a forced expulsion, that's his strategy for Gaza, and bomb the hell out of the place to get there. Um, how serious a position is this within Israeli discourse? Well, before the assault on Gaza began in earnest, before Operation Protective Edge was announced, Faglin, who is one of the deputy speakers of the Knesset, called for Israel to cut off electricity and water to the Gaza Strip. There are signs around Israel which are calling for this uh, in public streets, saying it's, a, it's the moral thing to do. And this is, you know, very mainstream right now. Um, the Israeli army has done just that. They attacked Gaza's only power plant. They've refused to restore electricity to the Gaza Strip from the outside. And 90% of the Gaza Strip is without water because of the attacks on the sanitation system have been so thorough. So Plan Faglin has really um, come, to, it's come to fruition through Operation Protective Edge. Now, during Operation Protective Edge, there's a sense of frustration in Israeli society that they didn't quite finish the job. The sense is that, okay, all, uh, 1,800 people have been killed. Um, all the Israelis I've been speaking to are aware of the level of civilian casualties. Over 300 children have been killed in the last month, most of them under 12 years old. But the soldiers are very frustrated. Israelis are frustrated um, that they uh, feel like, you know, in another year or two, there'll be another operation like this and 2,800 will be killed. And how long will they have to live with the Gaza Strip? How long will they have to live with rockets and tunnels? They want to finish the job. And Faglin um, is catering to that mentality by calling for this plan of expulsion and reoccupation. Many of the Israeli soldiers, as they were going in during uh, Operation Protective Edge, were singing, let's go back to Gush Katif, referring to the settlement that was evacuated in the Gaza Strip um, in 2006. Uh, many of the people I see at right-wing protests are former residents of, of Gush Katif, and they're really pushing for a reoccupation of northern Gaza. Um, but beyond that, is, there's the genocidal aspect of Faglin's remarks. And genocide, incitement to genocide, is incredibly common right now in Israeli political discourse. It's not just Faglin. There's Giora Eland, who is the, um, one of the heads of the Institute for National Security Services, which consults for the Israeli military. He's a former national security advisor, um, someone who's deeply embedded in the military intelligence apparatus. And today he published a piece in Yediot Aronot, which is the main newspaper in Israel, pretty much calling for genocide 
in the Gaza Strip, or at least justifying it. He's basically making the case that there are no civilians in the Gaza Strip because they elected Hamas as Germans elected Hitler. This is the same rationale that Osama bin Laden used to justify the 9-11 attacks and the indiscriminate slaughter of Americans because they had elected governments which had attacked the Middle East, uh, which had attacked Muslim nations. So you're hearing this from mainstream figures, not just from crazy old Faglin, who's winning lots of fans and followers with this kind of rhetoric, who's really keeping up a public profile. Ayelet Shaked is another figure who's called for genocide. She is a rising star in the Jewish Home Party, which is the third most popular party in Israel, a senior partner in the um, Netanyahu's governing coalition. She called for exterminating Palestinian mothers uh, to prevent them from giving birth to quote unquote, little snakes. And last night, um, along with uh, Leah Tarachansky, who's your correspondent for the Real News um, in Israel-Palestine, I followed a march of settlers um, led by this group, Women in Green, um, who established new religious nationalist settlements around the West Bank. Um, we followed them up to the Jaffa Gate in the old city of Jerusalem. And there um, we heard more genocidal rhetoric um, at, the top of, at the top of this hill. I um, interviewed Daniel Luria, who is the head of Ateret Kohanim. It's a 501c3 pro nonprofit in the United States that raises money tax exempt in order to eject Palestinians from their homes in East Jerusalem and replace them with Jews. And Luria, um, in con denouncing what he called the snakes to the south, um, the serpents to the south, referring to the people of the Gaza Strip, um, said that Israel had to take care of the sons of Amalek. Whenever you hear the word Amalek, the term Amalek, that is a call for genocide because Amalek was the incarnation of evil in the Bible and in Jewish history is considered anyone who wants to wipe out the Jewish people. And the only way to handle Amalek is, as, is as he was handled in the Bible, complete destruction. And that's what Daniel Luria told me in English in his Australian accent, that the Amalekites had to be eradicated. Uh, finally, just a word about um, Faglin's view of the Gaza Strip and the view of um, many of, of the people in the religious nationalist camp who are an incipient political movement in Israel, they believe that the Gaza Strip is part of I Israel because um, it had been inhabited by Jews some several thousand years ago before it was inhabited by Palestinian Arabs. And so this idea of actually expulsion from the Gaza Strip to the Sinai Peninsula is, uh, you know, part of this messianic plan for fulfillment of a kind of um, religious revival or yeah, redemption me, of the land me, of Eretz Israel. I'll read a little bit from Faglin's op-ed here. After saying that whole areas of Gaza should get one, a single warning and, and then be bombed without regard to, he says, um, human shields or environmental damage. Environmental damage, I suppose, means blowing up houses and hospitals and schools and, and whatever else. After saying that, here's how he describes what comes next uh, after conquering. He has, one of his points is called conquering. After the IDF completely s completes the softening of the targets with its firepower, the IDF will conquer the entire Gaza using all the means necessary to minimize any harm to our soldiers with no other considerations. Then he has a, a, a title called Elimination. The GSS and IDF will thoroughly eliminate all armed enemies from Gaza, the enemy population that is innocent of wrongdoing and separate, separates itself from the armed terrorists, will be treated in accordance with international law and will be allowed to leave. Israel will generously aid those who wish to leave. Then he has a section called Sovereignty. He says, Gaza is part of our land and we will remain there forever. Liberation of parts of our land forever is the only thing that justifies endangering our soldiers in battle to capture land. Subsequent to the elimination of terror from Gaza, it will become part of sovereign Israel and will be populated by Jews. This will also serve to ease the housing crisis in Israel. The coastal train line will be extended as soon as possible to reach the entire length of Gaza. Um, how serious a scheme is this? I mean, how seriously is this kind of a scheme being taken? Well, it's not taken seriously as a kind of blueprint for action. Um, the blueprint that you know, Israel's enacting 
um, is, is, uh, has been spelled out and it's not by someone like Faglin. But what Faglin is doing is, you know, he's just a demagogue who's playing to the most base impulses of Jewish Israeli society. And those impulses are towards genocide. Um, the, the way that the Gaza Strip has been conceived according to the designs of Zionism makes genocide possible. And the way that Palestinians are viewed in general, but particularly in the Gaza Strip, um, in the increasingly um, eliminationist Jewish-Israeli mindset is um, something that should concern everyone who, um, you know, thinks that, you know, a uh, sort of modern industrial, industrialized nation state with a highly educated public that claims to be a democracy could not commit genocide. I mean, I think we are witnessing some kind of incarnations of genocide in the Gaza Strip right now. And, you, you and would, what Fagelin is doing is, go ahead. I, I said you would have thought there was some kind of line the Israelis would cross that would be, you know, a, a little bit too far for even the American political elite and media elite. But but this what's going on now, there doesn't seem to be a line they can cross that will actually uh, erode what seems to be almost completely unconditional support. Well, let me let me talk about that in the context of the logic of, you know, of of maintaining the Gaza Strip as a kind of human warehouse. I mean, the Gaza Strip is, can, is its population are 80% refugees. They've been ethnically cleansed from what is now Israel. Uh, many of them are from the areas that rockets are fired to, and they can't be allowed to return because they will upend the Jewish demographic majority. Um, that means that um, if they were Jews, they wouldn't be in the Gaza Strip in this ghettoized area. Um, they're being kept there simply because they're, uh, they're of the wrong ethnicity. And so they have to be kept there. I mean, the Egyptians don't want them. They don't want them in the Sinai and tent camps, as Fagelin proposes. And Jewish Israelis uh, will fight tooth and nail to prevent them from coming back. So the Gaza Strip has become a warehouse for surplus humanity. And the siege of the Gaza Strip is simply a means of maintaining uh, indefinitely this kind of situation. Since the siege was imposed after 2006, uh, when the settlers of Gush Katif were removed, um, Arnon Solfer, who we talked about in a previous interview, is a government advisor whose role is primarily to um, consult on maintaining the Jewish demographic majority, said that we will have to kill and kill and kill every day, all day, in order to suppress the threat from the Gaza Strip. Um, Avi Dichter, who was then the head of the Shin Bet, Israel's general security service, said we have wider latitude of action in the Gaza Strip because there are no longer Jewish settlers there. It's basically a frontier area. So they brought in a guy, Asa Kasher, a Tel Aviv University professor of philosophy who has consulted for decades for the Israeli military on um, basically re removing Israel from the Geneva Convention's protection of civilians, um, the you know, ru rules of proportionality and rules of distinction on targeting civilians, and basically change the rules of engagement so that the Israeli armed forces no longer would have to view civilians in the Gaza Strip as civilians. Um, in Kasher's, Kasher's words, they were the terrorists' um, non-dangerous neighbor. And so Israel no longer views people in the Gaza Strip as civilians. All of them are either terrorists or simply uh, people who happen to be living next door to terrorists. They can be eliminated at any time. They're basically bare life. Now that um, doctrine uh, was what the U.S. began applying in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and especially um, in Obama's drone wars in Yemen and in the tribal reg regions of Pakistan. Uh, this, this, this way of, of viewing people who live in these um, stateless frontier areas was established by Israel and has been adapted by the U.S. And it's very important um, for the uh, kind of the, the way that the U.S. engages militarily now um, to protect this Israeli invention of asymmetrical warfare from challenges to it, legal challenges through international law. And that's why the U.S. is basically, it's one reason, besides our domestic political situation, it's one reason why the U.S. under Obama is simply unwilling to impose any limit 
on the amount of force that Israel can exert against the people of the Gaza Strip. It's because the U.S. has adopted the same mentality to those it has deemed its own its, um, its own enemies. Yeah, once, once you can defend the killing of hundreds of thousands of Iraqis in the name of defense of American security, um, and then you have created and uh, this whole rationale that it doesn't collateral damage the death of thousands of civilians, it's okay, because I'm all right, Jack. Exactly. I mean, in, in Operation Cast Lead, which is Israel's attack on the Gaza Strip in 2008, 2009, um, it, I think a lot of your viewers will remember that Israel used white phosphorus on, civilian, on the civilian population of the Gaza Strip, which heats up your flesh to 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. They actually attacked the UN shelter with white phosphorus. And when they were criticized... Excuse me, and, I, uh, I just brought it back. We just went through the white phosphorus thing, and we didn't need to go that way again. But, okay, now since they made that video, which was just in Wednesday or something last week, or anyway, real recently, uh, as you probably are aware, the ceasefire in Israel has stopped. They're now mounting, remounting, redoubling their efforts to completely destroy the place. Anybody that says that, oh, they won't do that, they, they, don't, they won't really push all of these people off that land, and continue the entire takeover of Gaza. They won't do that. But my God, folks, wake up. They're halfway through already. They've destroyed the water. They've destroyed the power. They've destroyed the sewers. They've bombed all the hospitals. They've wiped it out. People are dying. And without any justification, anybody that says Israel is defending itself is a damned liar or the stupidest moron you ever saw, because it's a lie, and it's an obvious lie, when Israel is the aggressor, totally the aggressor, and you don't get to say that the Palestinians are terrorists when they try to survive the Israeli attack, and they throw rocks at the tanks. Oh, well, that's a good reason to kill them. Okay, well, in the meantime, United States has jumped back into it. Now, Look at the, what's going on everywhere in Israel, in Syria, in Iraq. It's all the same war run by the same people. Every one of them is supplied by the United States on both sides. Both sides. That's what the United States is in. A, it's a business. It's a war business. That's the only thing our government is there for, is to make business for the industrial, military, congressional complex. So we're bombing Iraq again. And it's all about ISIS. Remember, we created Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda morphed into ISIS. ISIS morphed into IS. And the gullible idiots think that those are different groups. They're the same people, the same flags, everything, and they're all run by Western intelligence. And Hamas is run by Mossad, uh, the Muslim Brotherhoods run by MI6, Al Qaeda is run by the CIA, and they all share their resources. Let's go on to this next, Paul J. We don't have enough time. We're only going to see half this clip. We're going to go out on this clip. We'll see you next Saturday. This is Paul J. And, I mean, this is not Paul J. Um, it's Russia Today with uh, Amy uh, or <laughs> Abby Martin. I'm sorry. Abby Martin on Russia Today and George Galloway again. And we're going to see a little bit about the fact that the rest of the world knows the origins of Al Qaeda, ISIS, and so on. So let's play this one and see you next week. it back my computer died 
in the meantime doggone it i can't play that clip for you and i don't really have a lot of gift of gab to go here there's no way i oh god this is terrible let's uh can you can you go back to the clip we were just playing we'll finish the end of it and in the meantime maybe i can come up with something else what a rotten thing i hate technology sometimes and it, they keep it so hot in here it's, the computer isn't supposed to be in this environment all right well the other thing why, why don't we just open it up for phone calls then if anybody wants to call in we've got seven minutes left we'll keep true to the thing about being a live call-in show phone number is 503-288-4448 so if you want to call in, especially if there are any Israeli supporters out there that somehow can justify the carnage that's going on and somehow want to try to convince us that it's really a protective act, then go ahead. I'd, I'd like to hear from you. I'd like you to call in and try to, I'd like to see how you can possibly justify it. Not to mention the question that George Galloway asked earlier. Remember that one? What gave Great Britain the right? Okay, well, we're going to finish up with this. You can still call in. We'll switch to you if you do call in. In the meantime, this is the end of the Paul J. interview we are just watching. Or was that a call? <laughs> if that's a call, what do we got, a call? Am I on? Okay, it's either the video or a caller. I'm ready. To oh, I hear somebody out there, but I need more volume in here, please. Okay, try it again, caller. Uh, last Wednesday, did you catch the show on in the evening on uh, OPB Plus about 7, 8 o'clock for almost two hours about uh, Iraq? I saw some of that, but I didn't really get much chance. I was doing some videos here on that same time. But okay, uh, the, main, the main thing I really liked about it was because uh, years ago when we had the big troop surge, it was reported at the time of the surge that with 32,000 troops, uh, $35 billion was rolled in uh, with that. And But after the first day or two of coverage, they they don't cover the $35 billion anymore, and I was wondering how that <laughs> was passed up. Now, in that documentary, they show General Petraeus forming his own army, they said, uh, of the Sunni Arabs, and uh, showed him bundling up bundles of $100 bills with a paper contract around each one to each one of the tribal leaders, and they accept these packages of money. Yeah, that's... These that was, and they uh, are, you know, agreeing not to shoot at the Americans. Now, that, <laughs> in my mind, that was the success, all success of the surge. Stop shooting us. We'll give you $35 billion bucks. We'll roll into town. Everything will look great. Well, the money ran out because the Sunnis were unemployed then, and now the money's out, so they going about their merry way. Hey... If the Americans want to contain and uh, those uh, ISIS and ISIL, why don't they get General Petraeus, reactivate him, get his boys? He was the commanding general of uh, uh, Sons of Iraq, they called him, <laughs> something like that. Have uh, him go in there, command his troops to stand down. Put those Americans' weapons down and let those uh, Shiite uh, military, Iraqi army, the ones that dropped all their weapons, clothes, Everything America, and all that 10 years of training just left it all on the ground. Maybe those chicken shits will get the spine to stand up for their own goddamn rights. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> well, thanks for, thanks for the contaminating language, but, uh, you know, I, I understand your, the sentiments that you're expressing, but you don't get to blame the people for not standing up after we bomb them to the Stone Age and then do it again and kill millions of their children without any sort of remorse when Madeleine Albright was asked in retrospect with the million and a half children under 12 that we slaughtered, do you think in retrospect that maybe we should have tried something else? Was it worth it? And Madeleine Albright said, yes, she thought it was worth it. She's willing to kill one and a half million of your children to achieve her ends, whatever it was. So don't you dare hold those people responsible 
for fighting for themselves after we destroy them. Put blame where it belongs on the colonial imperial power of the United States and Israel. I don't know which one is the puppet, but they're for sure working in unison. Every one of those plans that you see Israel doing is completely supported politically and economically by the United States. And Israel could not do it without the United States' help. So if you care about humanity at all, demand that we sever our ties with Israel and condemn them like the hundreds and hundreds of UN resolutions that the United States has vetoed condemning Israel for its actions. It's about time that we stop vetoing the insanity. I mean, stop vetoing the condemning of the insanity. Okay, if there's a caller, I'll take it. <laughs> okay, well, <sighs> if you're not as outraged as I am, you better check your humanity. Do you have any of it left or have you let it atrophy? How on earth can you allow any of this to happen? When you see bombs falling anywhere or, bomb or guns being pointed anywhere, that is a total, number one, it's a, if everything else is equal, it's a total failure of the politicians and they should be kicked out for having, allowing a war to start. A war is the last, 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 resort and but if you get down to causes this again is only for the benefit of the money elite rich it has nothing to do with the stupid ideologies that we all argue about it's not israel and the jews against the muslims and the palestinians it's not that at all it's a power grab it's it it's greed it's evil but don't you even stop and think that it's some fight for justice anywhere. I mean, the Palestinians, the, the underdog always tries to fight for justice. But the people running the show claim justice is their side of it, but they're lying. Well, next week I'm going to play this clip. By then it'll be a week old, but it's worth seeing. And for yourself, if you want to spend the time... Look up uh, Abby Martin, Russia Today, Breaking the Set is the name of her particular show, Breaking the Set, and check out the latest interview with George Galloway, Minister of Parliament, founder of the Respect Party in Great Britain, and the one who just got crowdfunding for a movie called Killing Tony Blair. And he, George Galloway just announced that this movie will... If it doesn't put Tony Blair in prison, it will certainly prevent him from ever being employed ever again. We'll see if he lives up to his claims when the movie comes out. I believe it's coming out in September. We will see. I'll keep you posted. See you next Saturday.